Welcome to this training session from Arrowhive covering medium contention. Medium contention. In this session we will discuss carrier sense multiple access with collision avoidance, physical carrier sense, virtual carrier sense, pseudo random back off timers, interframe spacing, Wi-Fi multimedia quality of service based on 802.11e and hopefully answer some of the questions for you that you may have about these particular topics. Carrier Sense multiple access with collision avoidance is used by 802.11 since you cannot detect a wireless collision. Carrier Sense is listening to the medium, sensing it. In this case the medium would be a radio frequency or the air. Multiple access means that many client devices or many access points could be accessing the medium at the same time. Collision avoidance, avoiding collisions that may occur on the medium during transmission. Due to hidden nodes and physical blockage in uh, the Fresnel zone, there may actually be some collisions that collision avoidance can't really uh, avoid having. But there is a best effort to make sure that collisions are avoided by using contention mechanisms so that only the device that wins the contention should be transmitting. Contention basics. Prior to transmission, every Wi-Fi device should make an effort to determine if the medium is idle. By idle, that means no other device using the same technology is transmitting at that moment. If the medium is determined to be idle, then they are able to transmit. If the medium is not idle, then they're going to have to defer or back off until the device that has won the transmission rights is finished transmitting. The basic parameters that must be considered before any Wi-Fi device transmits are the physical carrier sense which is the clear channel assessment, the virtual carrier sense which is a network allocation vector, the back off which is waiting for other devices to complete their communications and interframe spacing, the spacing between frames and acknowledgments and the differential interframe spacing when the medium is idle. These mechanisms follow Wi-Fi radios to attempt to avoid uh, collisions. If these mechanisms are not followed, there will be a lot of collisions, meaning that the intended receiver would not acknowledge the transmission and the original transmitter would have to retransmit. Physical Carrier Sense The physical media dependent sublayer of layer one of the OSI model is where the radios will listen to see if there is another 802.11 signal in the air. If there is no 802.11 signal in the air, the medium is deemed to be idle and the radio will transmit. If uh, there is another 802.11 signal in the air, that signal will have a duration value. That duration value can be between zero and 32,768 microseconds. Whatever that value is, the client that is trying to transmit will take that value and populate the network allocation vector, which is another logical timer, and count that down, then come back, revisit the clear channel assessment, and make sure that no one is transmitting. If there is not a transmission in the air at this time, then the device will be able to transmit. If another transmission is heard in the air, then the back off procedures continue. The virtual carrier sense means that I know that I've already tested the physical carrier and I, I've found some traffic out there. So I'm going to take whatever that traffic's duration value is and I need to defer or back off for that. As you can see in this example, station one is looking to, to transmit. The duration value and the frames that it hears could be, in this case, 44 microseconds. It could be quite a bit longer if necessary. The duration value is never about the frame that is currently in the air, however. 
It is about the inner frame spacing that follows and any required frames that need to be there to support this transmission. Every other station in the service set or the basic service set area on the same frequency will hear this frame when they do their clear channel assessment for the physical sense. Then they're going to populate their network allocation vector, that value, with the value from the duration field, in this case 44. Then the clients will count down that 44, perform another clear channel assessment prior to transmitting their own frames. The pseudo random backoff timer is used to reduce collisions. On a wired network, if two devices transmit at the same time and their frames collide, you would be using collision detection. Both devices would hear the collision, then kick off their pseudo random backoff timer, count that down, transmit, and miss each other. However, with Wi Fi, you cannot detect the collisions. So the pseudo random backoff timer is used to reduce these collisions by counting down prior to transmission. The pseudo random backoff timer must be counted down all the way to zero prior to transmitting. It is multiplied against any slot times for retransmissions. The slot time duration value is dependent upon the modulation technique. Frequency hopping spread spectrum from the original 1997 version of the 802.11 standard uses a 50 millisecond slot time. Direct sequence spread spectrum uses 20 and orthogonal frequency division multiplexing or OFDM uses 9. Interframe spacing. Interframe spacing is the spacing between the frames, the acknowledgments, and the differential times when the medium is open for contention. The interframe spacing is simply a period of time that exists between the transmissions of wireless frames. Wi-Fi multimedia and quality of service. 802.11e introduced quality of service and the Wi-Fi Alliance introduced Wi-Fi multimedia QoS and if Wi-Fi multimedia QoS combined with devices that support 802.11 exist to provide some type of dedicated quality for particular types of traffic like voice and video. The 802.11e amendment broke this traffic into eight different categories. The Wi-Fi Multimedia Quality of Service, or WW, excuse me, WMM, has condensed that into four. The highest priority would be voice priority. If voice traffic is not given a higher priority, it will fall into the realm of data and you get choppy phone calls that sound really bad like that. By allowing it to have a higher quality of service and be given more transmit opportunities than lesser important traffic, you get clear, precise phone calls. If it were data, and frames arrived out of sequence, it wouldn't really matter that much because they're all going to be rebuilt on the other side anyway later. And they can be retransmitted with no trouble. With voice and video, if a frame has arrived inappropriately, that's one hiccup in communication. If it had to be retransmitted, that would be a second hiccup. So with quality of service, you have kind of suspended the rule that all unicast frames must be acknowledged. Video priority will be the second priority, and best effort priority would be traffic from legacy devices or traffic from applications or devices that lack QoS capabilities. And then there's also background priority, uh, which is very low traffic, like file downloads, print jobs, things that don't have any kind of strict latency or throughput requirements. Wi-Fi multimedia quality of service. When you look at uh, what happens with the uh, voice, video, best effort, uh, traffic, and background, all of that information may be waiting to go out of a QoS-enabled device. However, it's not the highest priority. So it's going to go to the back of the line unless it is voice or video, and it'll have to wait its turn. Now, when a device wins the contention for the medium, 
in other networking scenarios, they can send one frame. In a QoS environment, Air 211E, you are allowed to have a transmit opportunity. You'll see that written as TXOP, and some people actually pronounce it as TIXOP. So you have different transmit opportunities based on the type of information you need to send, and internally, there's also a contention based on the priority of the data. This illustration is based on an internal contention and you can see that voice and video are being given more opportunity to get into the radio itself to go out to the antenna. If I'm just doing voice on a phone, I shouldn't worry about the other traffic or just doing video with maybe uh, an Apple TV or something. I'm not going to worry about uh, the other traffic. But if I'm using a laptop or something that is capable of all of these, then internally I'm going to have this type of contention just like I may have that type of contention in the air for multiple device types. 8021D prioritize traffic streams. When you look at voice, video, best effort, background, you will get the transmit opportunities and to have an a, a chance to go to the antenna to be radiated in the air. So this internal contention happens prior to the traffic being placed in the air on all QoS enabled devices. Thank you for watching this session from Arrowhive. Please continue the rest of the series at your earliest convenience. Welcome to this session from Arrowhive covering the Media Access Control or MAC sublayer. In this session we're going to cover 80211 frame formats, 80211 frame types, active and passive scanning, authentication and association, acknowledgments, layer 2 retransmissions, and hopefully answer some of the questions you may have had about these topics. The Media Access Control Protocol Data Unit, or MPDU, is a combination of the 802.11 MAC header and the frame check sequence, which controls or has the, all of the cyclical redundancy check uh, information for error correction. When you look at the first part of this header, you're going to see frame control. And inside the frame control, you will find information about what type of frame this is, what subtype of frame it is. Then you're going to have the duration ID. The duration ID has a duration value that will be used in the contention process. Any other 802.11 device in the same basic service set area on the same frequency that wants to transmit, when they perform their clear channel assessment, will see another frame in the air. The frame in the air will have a duration value equal to the amount of time it will take for the inner frame spacing that follows the frame and any acknowledgments or any part of completing that communication. The duration value can be anywhere from 0 to 32,768 microseconds. The address fields you see, 1 through 4, are also included. You will see the transmitter MAC address, the receiver MAC address as the wireless addresses, and there's also the actual source and destination addresses which could be wired or wireless. When you're looking at most wireless traffic, you will only see three MAC addresses used in these four spaces. The source MAC address will be the address of the device that actually began the communication. The transmitter address would be the address that put the frame in the air. The receiver address would be the, the address of the device that pulled the frame from the air, and the destination address would be the address where the frame was ultimately supposed to go. The reason you see three mostly would be in an example of a, a laptop sending something to a wired side server. So you would have the laptop's MAC address as both the source and the transmitter address. The AP would be the receiver, and the wired device would be the ultimate destination. The opposite is true when the wired side device responds. The wired side device would be the source, 
the AP would be the transmitter and the client would be both the receiver and destination. You can see four addresses in use if it is part of a wireless distribution system. A client in one building, wired or wireless, sends a frame to a mesh point in that building which would be the transmitter address. It puts the frame in the air. The mesh endpoint on the other end of the mesh would be the receiver and then the device on the wired network or maybe another wireless device uh, on the other side of the mesh would be the ultimate destination. The MAC service data unit, MSDU, or the upper layer protocols payload, can be encrypted so that you're not really going to see the payload. Everything else in that 802.11 frame is going to be in clear text always in order for 802.11 to function properly. Even on a wired network, the layer 2 information is always visible on the subnet. 802.11 frame types. There are three 802.11 frame types, management, control, and data. Management frames are used for finding, joining, and exiting service sets. Subtypes of the management frame would include things such as beacons, probe request, probe response, authentication and association request and response, deauthentication, disassociation, and action frames. Control frames are used for media reservation, such as ready to send, clear to send, clear to send to self, or acknowledgments. Data frames can be just the frames carrying pure data which would have the encapsulated layer 3 through 7 payload. You can also have null functions for a null data frame used in power saving modes and you can have a combination frames that will be data plus some type of control function depending on the network configuration. Finding a network can either be done passively or actively. If you're doing it passively, the clients just listen for beacon frames coming from access points. Any SSID that they're configured to join, they may automatically join. If you are just looking to see what networks are available, you may be in your supplicant and choose to view the available networks and see what's out there strictly based on the beacon frames. Any access point that is not broadcasting its SSID will not be found through passive scanning. However, they will be found through active scanning. In active scanning, the client is configured to use a specific SSID. It contends for the medium and wins the contention. It sends a probe request, a broadcast frame, looking for any access point using a particular SSID. Every access point that hears that will respond back if they are using that SSID. Every unicast frame is supposed to be acknowledged, but when I'm using active scanning, I'm broadcasting out and it's not really an acknowledgement so much as it is a response to the broadcast. Uh, the client station is going to transmit management frames, which are called probe requests. APs will reply with probe response frames. And anything that is required from that network to join it will be part of a probe response. A probe response is a unicast frame from an AP to the MAC address of the device that sent the broadcast beacon out. If someone were hiding their SSID but the clients were using active scanning, every probe request would include that SSID, every probe response would include that SSID. The only thing missing from the beacon frame when you hide the SSID is just the SSID information. You will see things inside a probe response that are exactly the same information you would find in a beacon such as channel, uh, encryption requirements, anything special about the network is going to be there. The only thing that would really be missing from a probe response that you would find in a beacon would be information for dozing stations such as the TIM element or DTIM information. 
association and the four-way handshake. When a client station associates with an access point, it becomes a member of the basic service set. To do so, it must support the same security mechanisms, data rates, and have other like configurations. Some things can be configured on the access point side to be mandatory. And if a client does not support those, even though they have all of the right credentials to authenticate, they may not be allowed to associate because they don't meet all of the criteria that the access point requires. The four-way handshake is a security exchange between an access point radio and a client station radio used to create dynamic encryption keys. Joining a service set. Joining the service set can be done through active or passive scanning. If it's passive scanning, the client's just going to simply listen for beacon frames from the access points, and if it hears the SSID that it's configured to use, it will send uh, association and authentication requests to the access point to join the service set. If it is using active scanning instead of passive scanning, the client will send out a probe request, get a probe response, then it will send an authentication request, here are my credentials. I'd like to join your service set. The AP will send back an association, uh, excuse me, authentication request. Then you'll have an association request. The association request and association response will occur. At that point, you are connected, but only to a certain degree. Beyond that, there are multiple different types of authentication mechanisms that may require more exchanges between the client, the supplicant, and the access point, the authenticator. Depending on the different extensible authentication protocols you're using, you could have a lot of extra exchanges. If you're using WPA pre-shared key, which is now called WPA personal, then you would have a four-way exchange where you would have a process of building the pairwise master key for their association. Then once the pairwise master key is built, you will get a groupwise transient key and a pairwise transient key and a lot of other things built for that association. But initially, you're going to have the pairwise key between the client and the Hive AP. If the client decides to roam, then it will have to go through a similar process called reassociation. I'll send a reassociation request to the next access point, and in that reassociation request is information about the last access point to which I was connected. Inside Arrowhive, you can implement a client monitor against any client that you see in the airspace then you can watch the exchange between the client and the access point. In this example, if you look at the lines, you will see this is a WPA pre-shared key authentication starting, and you'll see sending message one of four, then you'll see receiving two of four, then you'll see sending three of four, receiving four of four. That is the completion of the four-way handshake. Then the pairwise transient key will be set, authentication is successfully finished at that point. At that point, the client is free to begin connecting on layer three. It may send out a DHCP request, receive an acknowledgement, and the DHCP session would be complete. At that point, the client is fully associated, they're connected to the network, and they can gain access to anything that is available on the network. If at any point in the authentication, it fails, for example, the most common reason would be the user putting in the wrong pre-shared key. You would see one of four, I'm sending my request. Two of four, I receive the response from the AP, but I, I, I don't really get the third part of the handshake because my key doesn't match. Then you would see one of four and two of four again, and then you would see the access point send a deauthentication message to the client and it would read something like uh, client deauthenticated due to notification of driver which basically means the access point has received failed pre-shared key connection attempts from the client 
and has now kicked the client off of the connection because they obviously have put in the wrong key. Then the user will be prompted again to put in the correct key. This may go on until the user puts in the right key or calls the help desk. But you can see this inside client monitor from wherever you're sitting without having to go out into the field and run uh, some type of frame capture. Client monitor is a tool that is included with Hive Manager. Acknowledgements. Every unicast frame in 802.11 is supposed to be acknowledged because you cannot detect collisions in 802.11. The transmitting radio would send a unicast frame out to the intended receiver. The intended receiver will send back an acknowledgement. If the transmitting radio sends the frame and the data integrity check fails, or the packet never arrives at the intended receiver due to colliding with some type of noise, the transmitting device has an acknowledgement timeout threshold. If that acknowledgement timeout threshold is reached prior to receiving an acknowledgement, then the client will multiply its pseudo random backoff timer against its slot times to create an additional backoff counter. We'll count that down then do another clear channel assessment and attempt to transmit again. The, the transmitting device will do that up to 32 times before it decides that the host it's trying to communicate with is unreachable. Up to a 5 to 10 percent retransmission rate may be deemed normal for a network based upon the traffic and the client types that are there. Every 802.11 unicast frame should be acknowledged including deauthentication and disassociation frames. Layer 2 retransmissions. Retransmissions decrease throughput in the network. Transmission, transmitting radios that do not receive an acknowledgement will try again to transmit the same information which increases the, the contention in the domain and decreases throughput. Retransmissions are the same information and inside that frame, if you were to gather the frame with the frame analyzer, you would see that it is marked as a retransmission. However, you would not know if it was the first time it was being retransmitted or the 32nd time it was being retransmitted because there is no indication of how many times the device has tried already to communicate. It is simply indicating that this particular frame is a retransmission itself. Thank you for watching this session from Arrowhive on the Media Access Control sublayer. Please continue the rest of the series at your earliest convenience.